Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, deciding to listen to the team from EY. We are very happy to be uh, with you all today in this uh, webinar and to share our thoughts and experience on uh, COVID-19 recovery and what's next. Um, usually when we set the background to the environment under this context, under COVID-19, the typical tendency is to uh, start off on talking about all the negative aspects sometimes. So Sahan and I uh, thought we will, as much as possible, focus on the positive side. Isn't that right, Sahan? That's so, right. Yes, so uh, we thought we uh, do forgive us if we do astray a bit, but we are going to stay focused on the positives of um, recovery under COVID-19. So let's think about what has been happening in our environment and uh, you know how we need to sort of focus on moving forward. Uh, the situation uh, within the last three months has resulted in an unexpected shift in the use of technology. Starting from a simple concept like working from home, especially in our country where a lot of large organizations were very nervous to test this concept of working from home, immediately overnight had to ask employees to start working from home. And mind you, some of these companies were not technologically um, ready to accommodate this change. Moving away from the work environment, if we look at our own environments at home, we have started using a lot of the digital channels, even to order our groceries, our daily essentials, we are using a lot of technology. And during the last three months, the use of online payments, some of us were very nervous about using online payment systems, but now we are used to it and we are using it. So all of this change and research in Sri Lanka has actually shown that this change will lead to a lot of behavioral changes in our consumers. And some of these behavioral changes could be short term, but again, research has shown that it could be long term as well. Now, change in consumer patterns, change in consumer behaviors will affect organizations, whether you are a startup or whether you are a multinational because end of the day, you are dealing with your customers and your consumers. So you need to be aware of this change. Uh, and whilst our consumer behavior in uh, terms of your day-to-day -day needs have changed, again, research has shown that certain thought patterns in terms of um, your funding, and looking at long-term financial stability also has changed. So for example, maybe we had a culture of where we spend and then decide how we are going to finance it. You know, use of credit cards have increased tremendously in our economy, but now that might, at least a certain percentage of our customers may change their behavior in terms of looking at uh, sustainability and uh, savings oriented thinking. So these are some of the thoughts that have come about in the latest research that has been done. Of course, whether that will sustain in the long term, we need to see. Now, why is this background important? Because as I said, 
any company, whether you're a startup, a small, a medium term or a multinational, you are dealing with your consumers and you need to know what to expect from them. And you need to have your strategy set to address your consumers. And what better time than now to look at your business strategy? I know we are going to talk about uh, several aspects of cost management, working capital management, financing, etc. But before we go into those areas, we must see if our strategy of your startup also needs to change. And what better time now? Because, you know, you are sort of trying to find your way. So please, uh, we advise you to sort of look into these possible changes uh, in the marketplace, possible changes in your competition, and then align your strategy, your business strategy, towards addressing those changing environments. Um, Sahan, I'd like to ask from you also to share, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on these aspects? Yeah, Hirati, uh, definitely there have been a, a number of changes happening. And I think uh, we promised that we, not, we would not talk about the negative aspects. Uh, so I thought uh, I would also share some uh, positives uh, uh, in respect or as a result of uh, COVID-19. And just starting off with uh, subsequent to COVID-19 uh, uh, as a measure of uh, managing uh, foreign reserves, uh, the government uh, had to control a large number of imports or a list of items. So uh, for, from an entrepreneur's perspective or a, a person who's looking at business, I think this is definitely an opportunity for our people, our companies to get in and exploit. In addition to that, uh, now it's a situation where we, where the entire entire industry or the entire economy is suffering, other than a few companies who have you know who have been positively impacted with the situation. So in that case, there is an element or there is an opportunity where. Uh, clients or where businesses, uh, startups can, you know, go back and renegotiate on certain contracts. And if you look at the larger companies, the larger players in the markets, the larger corporates, they have thought some time back and they have actually uh, included these elements or these clauses in their uh, rental contracts, supplier contracts, in a way that could, they could, you know, uh, they could uh, delay their payments or probably uh, reduce their fees based on the reduction in their revenue or bottom line. So I think this is an opportunity for the smaller companies also to, to probably think about it. Initially, probably if they are working or if they, if they are on rent, to go back uh, to, to their tenant, discuss and see how, uh, be transparent about the situation and get that uh, cost benefit or reduction. And at the same time, going forward, even though we are talking about uh, startups, uh, uh, small in, uh, smaller companies, uh, they might also need to build in these to ensure that they manage costs appropriately going forward. So I think this is a trigger point and also an opportunity in that sense. Uh, furthermore, uh, I thought uh, from my personal experience, uh, uh, we've been uh, stuck with uh, certain larger players in the market when it comes to buying certain stuff. But uh, during the lockdown period, I don't know how it happened with you, Hirandi, but I was uh, very busy on WhatsApp, Facebook, and uh, discussing with my wife, sharing uh, suppliers. And I found a few, uh, a few interesting uh, online, uh, online businesses and I, and I have more faith uh, than ever before. So I was a person who never went uh, on online because I wanted to have the touch and feel. I always, uh, I was always afraid that the item that I purchased online 
will be uh, different when it comes to uh, handling it. But now, uh, now that perception had completely changed. So I think this would have happened through a larger customer base. And then uh, from a perspective of startup, they would have acquired a reasonable market share. So I think looking at this uh, uh, as, as a learning opportunity, I think something like this can happen uh, in the future also. So that's something that uh, companies can be agile uh, and plan for because that will be, uh, they'll be able to uh, earn a part of the business from the larger players. And what I also thought was, yes, we are talking about what's next. Do we really know what's next? I think uh, from, uh, from uh, COVID-19 perspective, from, from a Sri Lankan perspective, we know, okay, the cases are reducing. Uh, during the last few days, we didn't have any new cases. Uh, and whatever the cases reported uh, were from uh, those uh, uh, the, the, the restricted or quarantined areas. Uh, but so if everything happens well, if everything goes well, uh, we'll be lucky that we'll, we can get rid of COVID completely and uh, we can ensure a fast recovery. But at the same time, economies like China and uh, even uh, other uh, European countries, there have been a second wave that had come in. So then uh, one, one economic scenario is that we recover and then things settle back into normal. The second situation or the second uh, uh, second uh, probability is that this goes up through a year where we get affected by a second wave. And I don't want it, but this is uh, these are scenarios that can happen. And also there are medical researchers saying that COVID might retain within uh, the part of the world in certain pockets until a uh, proper medical solution is uh, is brought in. So in that case, we have to think about, you know, living with COVID for some time. So when it comes to planning, when it comes to strategizing, as you said, uh, Hiranti, I think uh, it is very important that uh, entities uh, be agile and keep on changing their plans in order to ensure that they, uh, that they, that they will be able to sustain even with further crisis situation. So I think uh, having uh, those in mind, uh, just the sentiments are like, we need to keep on forecasting uh, using multiple scenarios and probably realigning our plans depending on how things would happen. And also keep our stakeholders, keep things transparent with our stakeholders. Uh, just to share some small example, we have we hear a uh, large uh, uh, cost cutting, uh, salary cut, so on and so forth. Uh, though we might not encourage that, uh, if we can if we can keep all the stakeholders informed uh, and transparent about the situation of the company, then uh, then that might create less fear and more trust within the entity. It's the same thing with the suppliers. If we can, you know, be transparent with the situation, we may be able to uh, discuss and get a, uh, a credit extension in order for our business to sustain and also for that supplier to be to work along with us. So, uh, without uh, uh, wasting more time, I think we can dig into our topics. So, I think I would like to hand over. Uh, things to Hiranti to discuss about uh, cost management. Yes, Sahan. Um, so uh, we spoke a lot about how, how our environment is changing. And uh, something that Sahan said is we need to be more agile. And I personally feel that for startups in any stage is more easier to be agile than to a large, fully grown company. So that is actually one of the benefits of being a startup. Uh, and we also personally experienced it during the uh, last three months where some of the giants failed. The startups actually kept us going, uh, or the smaller companies actually uh, 
sort of kept us going. So moving on to uh, looking at restructuring, cost, etc. Um, I'd just like to share some of my experience uh, in the uh, time that we opened up the economy and some of the experience that I've had with our clients. Um, so we were asked Sahan to, uh, you know, come and look at this uh, organization's cost structure because everyone is uh, thinking that reducing costs is going to be the answer. So we went and had a chat with the management and uh, we started digging into some of the uh, numbers in that organization. And within this short time, we realized a few things which I thought I will share with the audience uh, today. Sometimes you grow so big, you know, you start looking at your revenue in percentages. You say, great, we did 25% growth from this year, last year to this year. Margins, uh, margins have slightly taken a dip, but don't worry, we'll catch up next year. Next year, we are going to do 35% revenue growth. You achieve the 35% growth and you see a small dip in the margin. That's all right to move on to the next year with a 40% increase. But you know, somewhere in your organization, you are bleeding. Now, over the years, you have not stopped to take a look at where is this bleeding happening. It may be in a small way, it may be in a big way, but no one has uh, taken the time to look at it because obviously you are in business, you are running your organization, you're handling so many things in your day-to-day -day, uh, you know, operations that you don't have time to go back, revisit and see whether your cost structures actually make sense. So in one of the organizations we noticed, um, we did a lot of analytics, they had data. So we looked at uh, some of their products, product units, and we saw that they were manufacturing those units in a particular manner that after a particular point were actually eating into their cost structures. So for example, to simplify, if you produced 100 units, they had a particular cost structure and their margins were acceptable. But if you exceeded a certain point, if you went up to 120, the cost structures were really eating into their margins, but they did not realize that. Why? Because they were pushing their revenue target. Revenue target is increase by 35%. So you bring your units, you increase your production in that manner, not realizing that the subtle change that you're doing to increase that production is eating into your margins. Having revenue targets is good, but you need to look at the uh, your structure holistically to see whether your margins are taking a beating as a result of driving revenue growth. So, you know, this organization was receptive to what we were saying, and now they're seriously looking at how to manage this situation while keeping revenue growth. What are the cost structures that they need to look into to make sure that the bottom line is not impacted? So when you look at cost structures, you can look at your main cost driver, which is your cost of sales or cost of, cost, cost of goods sold. You can look at sales and marketing cost. You can look at general overhead. It all depends on the type of material costs that are there in an organization. Again, we see certain organizations Blind is saying, we are going to cut down our sales and marketing by 20%. Or as Sahan already said, they take uh, blind decisions to say, we are going to cut our payroll cost. All our staff, we are going to, you know, reduce the uh, pay. You need to take a step back and see whether that is the strategy that you want to 
uh, move forward with, especially being a startup. Maybe your uh, staff, the number of staff that you have, it's just right for your organization. So do you really want to, uh, you know, put them through the hard times of going through a pay cut, working extra, etc. Are there better ways of uh, uh, putting your cost structures down without affecting your productivity, efficiency, and growth in your organization? So these are some of the um, things that you need to answer. Um, we spoke about the staff strength of um, startups and that it could be very limited and you may really need to have that staff to move the organization forward. You may even want more support in terms of skills and various other factors. So another option that startups can look at is maybe reach out to a few universities to see if there are uh, students who are willing to do research for you, who are willing to uh, invest their time in doing various projects uh, and come up with maybe innovative ideas to grow your business. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, university students who would like to come in as an intern and whilst they gain the exposure to your business, they can add value in terms of supporting you in uh, growing your business in these uh, critical times. Uh, another factor, another uh, uh, concept that you can look at and uh, you should look at is automation. If you are a startup uh, in, you know, your fifth year, sixth year, I'm sure you would have reasonable uh, work in terms of automatable uh, tasks. I'm sure your uh, employees are bogged down in manual repetitive work, which can be easily automated. If you are a startup in that fifth year or more, you probably have some sort of financial data which you prepare on a monthly, quarterly, or yearly basis. Maybe uh, your daily revenue invoice generation, your receipt process, your payroll, etc. So those could have a lot of manually driven tasks, which are suitable for automation uh, possibilities. So please do take up this time, uh, this uh, window of opportunity that you have got to really revisit the processes uh, and the structure in your organization to bring in more efficiencies and to minimize uh, cost in the organization. Uh, I also read uh, in one of the research material uh, that has been done in Sri Lanka that um, the cash runway in startups in Sri Lanka is less than three months. 88% of startups in Sri Lanka have less than a three month runway when it comes to cash. Now again, I would like to pose this question to the audience. I know you can't answer, but ask from yourselves. We are ta talking about all of this because of COVID-19. Think about before COVID-19, before March 2020. Did you even think about uh, these aspects of managing cash, working capital, managing your costs. I'm sure a lot of you entrepreneurs were solely with your whole heart and soul were trying to propel your business forward. But maybe you were already bleeding even in February, January 2020. Maybe you had cash problems um, even in January and February. But 
you just did not have the time to you know take a break sit back and look into your issues this is your opportunity take a fresh look revisit your cost structures see how you can improve your working capital see what better financing options are available to you and you know look at how you can move your organization forward uh i think i've taken a bit of time on talking about uh, cost restructuring of course if you all have any questions we can come back to the topic but let me now ask sahan to sort of uh, share his views on maybe cost restructuring and then move on to uh, working capital aspects for a startup thanks iranti uh, i actually uh, uh, during this time i was very curious i have my brother working in a manufacturing organization so uh, as as consultants as accountants i've been asking this question on how you are managing uh, which company is managing well and how what are the strategies that they are taking so uh, i think uh, before moving into working capital i think uh, many organizations uh, in order to survive or to to sustain within this difficult period uh, and also to manage their cost better uh, they they try to simplify uh, their production units so for example if they had uh, uh, 30 to 40 to sk us uh, being uh, being produced within their uh, production uh, pro uh, uh, their the factories uh, they have brought it down to the most critical or the most uh, margin driven products so by that uh, they have been able to address the issue of you know having one third of people working and also making sure that uh, they they don't have they don't waste a lot of time on switching the switching cost is reduced and so on so i think uh, from a startup perspective probably if you're at uh, if you're with solely with an idea just getting in this might not be applicable but if you're a company in the uh, growth stage or expansion stage this is also something you need to be looking at so i'll just uh, since we are uh, working with time i'll, I'll discuss uh, uh, certain aspects on working capital and how well companies can or startups can do and also i'll just touch base on the cost management aspects whenever possible so i think uh, uh, during the last few months at least uh, a few uh, statements that i have uh, always heard from uh, startups as well as listed companies uh, cash is king short runaways freeze of recruitments pay cuts so on and so forth so i think uh, this emphasize that you know people so people need to work out on how they are going to structure their cost and that there is some element of or an element of issue currently and also at the same time there is a huge working capital issue that needs to be addressed in top of that we actually did a small survey and 80% of the respondents have confirmed that working capital is one of their critical issues currently so i thought uh, before i discuss you know uh, some examples on working capital management just to give a brief structure on how how Uh, working capital can be looked at so i think now what most companies or startups would be doing or thinking is uh, tactical working capital what that means what does that mean well it's a short term it's a short term measures that companies do take in order to churn the cash so for example if you take from a global context there have been uh, there have been alcohol companies uh, producing sanitizers to ensure that the demand is met and uh, and manage their cash flows at the same time there have been vehicle giants such as ford and general motors moving into manufacturing of ventilators garments this includes uh, our sri lankan garments uh, manufacturing face masks and other protect protective wear so this is basically it's a very short term initiative uh, it's a tactical initiative to manage your working capital 
Then on the other hand, we have the operational uh, working capital management concepts. This of course includes our, uh, uh, our credit management, which is our data management, the creditor management, which is managing uh, with our suppliers. And then uh, we have our inventory and then also our cash. So this is uh, something traditional when we hear of uh, working capital management. Uh, these are the areas that we focus. So other than looking into tactical initiatives of managing a working capital, entities also need to review their current processes in their operational working capital. So if I'm just to start on uh, credit management, data management, I see uh, most of the entities, at least the entities that I have uh, audited beat manufacturing and I've done a few uh, uh, medium to small term entities also. Uh, I see uh, the invoicing, invoicing process of certain entities are not punctual. And then I'll just share an example that I myself witnessed during uh, this uh, COVID lockdown. So as I said, I was, uh, I was going through all sort of uh, Facebook sites and WhatsApp messages, numbers. And then I, I happened to order some uh, uh, goods uh, through, through a website. Uh, and I had to order through WhatsApp. The goods were delivered. And I was informed that uh, I would be shared uh, an account number where I could do the transfers. But uh, that happened and I never got a follow up. And I think after three or four days, I remembered that I never paid for it. So I, don't, I didn't want to have an issue with it. I called that number and then actually they had totally forgot. They had been doing orders after orders and they had been operating in a sole, uh, totally manual, uh, manual setup. And there had been two or three people apparently taking orders. So I think, uh, at this stage uh, where cash is king, uh, the operational working capital management uh, concept or the entire process needs to be looked at. So this, may, this will not uh, just limit to the larger company. This will have to be looked at by SMEs, startups, and everyone. Also, uh, another thing, uh, understanding human behavior as a whole, uh, and myself following up on my own data, I, uh, I have understood that the more number of follow-ups I give, the earlier that I give, I am able to recover my data. So previously, as Hiranti said, we were only worried about the revenue. If the revenue line is okay, uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll stay till the data hits 90 or even 180 days, and then you'll manage to somehow get it and in most cases or at least 90 percent it might not turn into bad debt but at this time when everyone is struggling with cash you following up today and a week's time might be uh, the the delay for you to not recover a data so it is important that uh, regular and timely follows up followed follow-up action is made in terms of your debtors and also some of these uh, startups or uh, uh, startup companies which are in the maturity stage might also be interested in uh, factoring arrangements because if your if your strength is not uh, if your strength is your operation your idea you might get some help uh, to recover your debts so i think this is one aspect going forward that companies may need to look at especially in managing their working capital then also I thought of uh, discussing a bit on uh, creditor management. Uh, so until now, people didn't have any issues. And once, uh, once you enter to an agreement with a supplier, you generally pay uh, at a particular date or whenever you want. Uh, most of the contracts do not have uh, uh, contractual terms in terms of uh, when you need to settle, especially with smaller players in the market. However, with my experience, I've seen uh, in terms of the larger companies, the corporates, the multinationals, they manage their working capital very well. 
so they'll have they'll they'll have a process in place and they'll ensure that your uh, your invoice or your payment is not settled until n minus 1 so that that would mean you'll take the maximum time to settle your uh, your uh, vendors so i think uh, startups and uh, smes also might have to take a leaf from this book and also uh, manage or have a strategy in terms of managing their critical suppliers and also renegotiating certain payment terms. In terms of inventory, I spoke about simplifying uh, the production list. If you go down and limit your number of SKUs during a short term period, probably that would help you uh, reduce your uh, inventory. Uh, and I think that could be a short term plan, but of course, if uh, situations improve going forward, you might be you might worry about your uh, market share. So my, you might go back to uh, your normal uh, list of SKUs. But from the short term, I think that would also directly help you manage your inventories better. And from uh, from a governance and control perspective, I think uh, cash management needs to be a KPI of everyone in the company. So I think if from your petty cash book to all your expenses, uh, to managing your capital expenditure, to reviewing whether it is essential as of this stage, needs to be looked at by all companies. So you might be having a significant capital expenditure that you had planned on this time, it's not that you should not go ahead with it, but with a lot of uncertainties, I think it would be wise on just delaying it a bit and also looking at further options on whether you can you know, reduce uh, the amount of outflow at a particular period of time. So uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, many companies, uh, larger companies do, and also the startups also can consider, it's uh, cleaning up your balance sheet. Cleaning up your balance sheet to the sense uh, you might need to look into deposits uh, that had been paid. In most of the companies you pay upfront deposit, but once the contract expires, that deposit is not collected. So this is based on audit experience. I think uh, for smaller companies, Previously, these might not have been uh, important or material, but now it's something that you might need to consider. Sale of scrap is another uh, thing that needs to be considered. As time is running out, I'll just also uh, brief you on the government initiatives that you also can look into. Uh, the government had introduced uh, the Saubagya Refinance Scheme, which is available for, uh, for businesses or entrepreneurs where you can get uh, a working capital loan for two years at a 4% rate. However, uh, this would go through normal credit assessment. From the discussions I have had with most of uh, the SMEs or the startups, what I've understood that they lack is a proper cash flow forecast. They have a great idea and, and they are positive about achieving it, but those numbers in head do not come into paper right. So I think this is one aspect that can be uh, supported with uh, or, or, or reworked with in order to ensure that your credit application is not rejected and that you get this necessary funding to your business. So in addition to that, uh, we've also discussed uh, this with a number of experts uh, and also I've studied a bit. I went through some research and also I understood that most of uh, startups uh, don't uh, end up in, uh, in, uh, in the share market or do not get into uh, investors. Uh, which is uh, which is uh, somewhat detrimental in the in 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 the perspective of the opportunities of expansion. 
So I think uh, a few reasons that I thought to myself, I think Hiranti also can add on. Uh, one reason is that uh, uh, as a startup, we look into the operation, we look into the idea, but sometimes our numbers, our books are not managed in accordance and we cannot have uh, a discussion uh, right then and there with a potential investor. So I think uh, entities may also uh, look, into, uh, uh, look into funding through equity and getting into venture capitalists, getting into uh, angel, getting support from angel funds, and also ultimately even have a plan on getting themselves listed. So I think uh, I've spoke a lot and I think I've gone over time. Uh, we have another uh, topic on knowing your numbers. I'll get uh, Hiranti to start off with and we'll just go through that as well. Thanks, Sahan. So, um... Now, um, in this topic, I'm actually supposed to convince all you entrepreneurs that financial information is uh, important, and I'm going to do my best to do that. So, uh, uh, Hiranti, uh, yes, we are accountants, so I think uh, even though we have left uh, a bit of time, uh, it is our duty from all uh, aspects to convince companies to have that is proper right. financial. <laughs> so let's see how this goes. <laughs> so have you all heard that um, French, they say, is the language of love. And uh, some say that accounting is the language of business. Why do they say that? It is because... You do so much in a day to grow your business. Take it from strength to strength. You meet it with so many challenges. You make decisions and you move on. You are growing your business every day. Where is that all reflected? When you go to a meeting with a banker or with your potential investors, you are able to talk for hours and hours about this great idea, this great company you have started. But in the eyes of an investor, in the eyes of a bank, to them what matters is what is behind your great uh, idea, thoughts, and your company. And that and up to now can only be communicated through your financial statement. So your financial statements are predominantly, in simple words, your income statement, your PL, balance sheet, cash flow statement. And then of course, to do your future projections, you come up with a a cash flow plan or a business plan for let's say three to five years. All these numbers must have credibility, fortunately or unfortunately. So you going up there with uh, some numbers on your own and sometimes unable to explain some of it is not going to help your cause. Being a startup who has been in the business for some time, you must have complete records of what you have been doing so far. Your revenue, your cost, your assets, your liabilities, all of that has to be completely recorded and reflected in the financial statements that you prepare. Leaving aside your external uh, parties like banks and uh, other investors, think about it from your perspective. You don't need to know your numbers in nitty gritty detail, but as an entrepreneur, be um, uh, mold yourselves for at least once a month check your numbers to see where are you heading. Sure, someone tells you your revenue has grown by 35%. Ask, 
What about my profit? What about my cash? What about my liabilities? Where, I, where is my business heading? Have a few dashboard indicators that you monitor on a monthly basis so that you know that your business is going in the right direction. Um, again, in order to bring credibility to this process, you must have a stronger governance within your organization as you go along. Because as third parties, as banks and other investors, they need to know that there is credibility in the information that you are putting forth. So do invest your time and your resources in making sure that the financial information that you get are credible. Again, leaving aside the third parties, just imagine you are making decisions based on some form of financial information. If that information is wrong, bottom line is the decisions that you are making are wrong. So uh, within this very short time, I'm trying to, uh, you know, inculcate that discipline or that principle that in any organization, whether you are big or small, you must have some sort of financial discipline embedded in the organization. But with that, I'd like to hand over to Sahan for his comments on uh, Yes, Hirati, I'll just uh, add a couple of more and hand it over to uh, Sasmini to get the questions in. I think that's also an important aspect. Uh, I think many organizations start small and they grow. and when they grow, there'll be a lot of compliance requirements. So that would mean you might not, if you don't start your accounting uh, process or your keeping track of your numbers at some stage, if you're expecting to grow or if you have the ambition of having, making your, uh, making your business or your idea uh, to be listed one day, you might not be able to do that without the financial statement. So as you grow, you will have to uh, submit your financial statements to several parties. Uh, if, you, if you're planning on listing one day, it'll, there'll be certain additional requirements. So that is one aspect that it is important that you have your numbers. And at the same time, there, are, there have been companies who have been bleeding uh, throughout a time without, uh, without knowing the fact that they have been doing. So these are the companies or these are the startups where the owners have the great idea. The great idea at inception is very feasible. It's profitable. But when the, but, but when the wheels hit the road, the actual profits or the margins don't come out the way they, plan, they have been planned. The cash flows keep on rolling. And after a few years, you understand, okay, uh, the cash flows are also as, not as good as it expected. And then you realize when you get an accountant to work your numbers, your profits are much lower than what they forecasted. So if you're a startup, you might have your basic uh, bookkeeping and also have your basic uh, uh, ratios and KPIs in uh, the smallest of system. It could be an Excel and then gradually wo uh, work up as you get into the growth and the expansion stage. So uh, that's uh, it from my end. I think uh, we can get uh, Sasmini to raise the questions. Uh, Sasmini? Hey, hey, Sam. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, very well. yes. Uh, okay, so I have a few questions directed uh, to me. Uh, one question is uh, actually this is for both of you. Uh, like uh, just to summarize, like uh, what uh, the uh, what do you call it uh, the entire session. Uh, 
uh, is there a like a right and wrong way to approach a post covid 19 world uh, like uh, summarize the entire session into this uh, question actually so like uh, yeah that's i think uh, directed at both of you well, uh, that's a tough one, Sasmini. Uh, whether there is a right or wrong way to approach uh, the recovery process. Well, if there, if we had a crystal ball, we would know the right way to go about it. But unfortunately, we don't. And I think that's why Sahan said that uh, we really don't... Um, know what the future is going to be. But that does not mean we can just, you know, look up and wait. We need to assess our environment and we need to uh, forecast and see what is the recovery trajectory going to be. Some of the initiatives that a startup or any organization does should be short-term uh, initiatives. Some of the uh, things that an organization must do should look into the medium term and the long term. Now, all of this would depend on how your environment is going to change. So short-term uh, initiatives that a lot of organizations have taken is start cutting costs. Okay, that may be the way to go because the prediction now is that the recovery is going to be long term, but it should not be done haphazardly. You must take a proper evaluation of your cost structures and do it in a, a appropriate manner. Again, I spoke uh, when I started the session on business strategy. So you must revisit your business strategy in terms of how you are going to move forward and then align your restructuring uh, uh, opportunities also along with that. For example, if your business strategy is to, let's say, um, innovate in the technic, technic, technological space. If that's going to be your business strategy, you're taking a decision to lay off staff or cut down on um, you know, your resources that are already within the organization. You are not going to achieve your business strategy because your staff are going to be more or less uh, demotivated and if you're going to lay them off, you're not, you're going to be left with no staff to meet that business strategy. So that is why you must do a scan of the environment, assess, reassess your business strategy and align that to the initiatives that you are going to move forward with based on short term, medium term and long. So those are my thoughts. Uh, Sahan, if you would like to add, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, in, uh, in short, uh, I would say uh, keep your eyes open, adapt, and be agile. So I think Hiranti wrapped up everything there. Yeah. So uh, following up with uh, Hiranti's answer, that's one more question. Uh, in a in an ideal recovery-based situation, what would be the uh, key in terms of numbers uh, that would have to be looked at in order to ensure success? Sorry, Sasmini, I didn't get the uh, question. Uh, so in, a, in an ideal recovery-based situation, what would be the key in terms of numbers that would, have be, uh, that would have to be looked at in order to ensure the success of the business? in an ideal recovery based uh, situation. You want me to take it up, Ira? Can I take it up? Yeah. 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 So I think uh, if we are talking about, you know, uh, recovery ASAP, I think uh, the biggest problem here is uh, uh, cash or, 
uh, working capital. So I think uh, the companies need to, uh, most of the time, or uh, uh, till now, entities were looking at uh, their PNL profit and loss or income statement. They were more focused on their revenue and profit. However, in the short term, your entire balance sheet will be much important than your profit and loss. So look at your balance sheet. If you can uh, uh, make sure that you can meet your short term working capital needs, then that will let you in the medium and long term to go back, uh, have a strategy on rec uh, of recovery and meeting your ultimate objectives and your long term numbers. So I think uh, from my perspective, uh, entities need to uh, manage your balance sheet. Uh, it could be your cash, which is the main focus, then your current assets and your liabilities and the remainder. So I think uh, from, from uh, I think that would be uh, my uh, perspective on the question that you asked. Kiranti, would you want to add on to that? Uh, no, sir. Uh, no. Uh, okay, so given that we only have two more minutes, I will ask just one more last question. Uh, uh, this is uh, like about, uh, so given the pandemic, uh, would the existent uh, growth drivers of a company subject to change? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I think... Uh, <laughs> That's why I said, you know, your business strategy now must be revisited. Uh, we've seen um, some of the companies, of course, I must say, uh, have, uh, you know, grown during these th last three months. So that is probably because they had a very agile environment. They were able to adapt to the new environment and move forward. Um, but as we all know, some of the companies uh, are kind of in a um, situation where they are unable to move forward. So obviously that calls for a revisit of what you need to do because the environment has changed. Now you need to see where you need to, you know, start tinkering around with your strategy and uh, the way you need to move forward and then align your growth in line with the new environment. Sahan, would you like to add anything? Uh, you are on mute, Sahan. Sahan, you're on mute. I think uh, Hiranti uh, summarized uh, uh, I think we need, we might have to change uh, where we are going to focus going forward. So uh, there'll be uh, certain drivers that post COVID that will have to focus differently uh, or focus more on. Yeah. Uh, so just like uh, it was a very insightful session, Hiranti, Hiranti and Sahan, uh, and just like uh, what you said, Accounting is uh, truly the language of business in terms of growth. And I have seen like uh, working with most of the startups here at Hatch and uh, during the mentoring programs, they had a lot of uh, like during the COVID season itself, they had a lot of financial, uh, like the questions that they had in terms of uh, financial aspect of their business. And I think uh, most of the questions that they had had been addressed by uh, uh, you both and uh, thank you so much for all the uh, like the content the questions being answered and uh, like uh, we can wrap up the session now, I think uh, since it's 6 30 as well uh, yeah uh, thank you so much have a good evening good evening thank good you. evening thank you, thank you.